Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adam Miles Pereira uh, and I'm going to give a talk on procedural sound design from embedded to games. So who I am, I am a creative technologist, a musician and a visual artist, sort of. Um, I, studied at Berkeley I studied at Berkeley College of Music in the electronic production and design department. Um, and after that I quickly deviated from being a musician and being more into installations and doing um, interactive media. Uh, and the main thing that I use is Max MSP. That's the thing that I was trained on and where it's the medium that I use to express myself. So what is procedural sound design? Procedural sound design is a technique or a method that involves using, al uh, that involves using algorithms to create dynamic, or, uh, dynamic audio experiences with certain parameters that that use real-time gen real generation of sounds. Um, so what does this mean is that you are, when you're designing a experience of some sort, be it for an electronic vehicle, be it for like an installation, for games, for an app, you are not recording samples that will then stay in your, mem in your, mem in your mem memory and get played at certain targeted events. You are writing a synth engine which is continuously gen which is continuously generating sound and based on certain parameters that you assign to that sound to that synth engine you can adapt the sound like you can change the pitch of it the tone the timbre the filtration the effects and all sorts of things now the question that i get asked is like why like why should we do procedural sound design the main thing that i talk about is that it just saves a lot of space because whenever uh, like let's say you have a trip play game and you're shipping it, uh, if any of you all have been on Steam, a AAA game is nearly like 60 to 80 GB. And I remember the times when I used to wait like two days to like download a game and just play it. Uh, but procedural sound design does decrease that size because you're not loading, so you're not shipping with a lot of assets that are just sound based. So what are some of the tools and, tech and, 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 te and technologies that you can use? Uh, there's, Max, there's Max MSP that is created by Cycling Set, by Cycling Set, Set MT4. Uh, it's a graphical programming language that lets you real-time gen generate sound and visuals. Uh, I'm pretty sure since we're in the audio dev community, there are a lot of people who use Max. Um, Max is paid. Uh, you can export code from it, but then as soon as you cross a certain threshold of income, there's some licensing that gets in that gets involved. Uh, there's Pure Data, which is kind of like Max, but a boiled down version. Pure Data is, kind of, is completely free. It's op it's op it's op open source. Um, if you're looking at commercial uh, at commercial stuff, there's Audio Weaver Designer that's based out of Boston. Um, they have a set of tools that you can also use to like compile code and run it, and it does real time all uh, and does real time audio problem processing. And if you're working in games, there's Vice that lets you use uh, procedural sound design. So I'm going to get into a few things. So Max MSP, how do you like make this patch in Max and then you take it out? Uh, there are two things. For the longest time, there was Gentilda. Uh, now what Gentilda is is it's a subset of Max that has uh, not all like every time you pull up a small thing in Max, it's called an all, uh, an op object. In Gentilda, you have all operators, which is a boiled down version of what you get in the whole world of Max. So you don't have all the filters that, that, uh, that, that you get. You have a very smaller subsection of operators that you can use. This does limit you in creating a very uh, immersive experience, but what you can do with that is that you can build your own filters, you can build your own synthesizers, uh, how you pass in MIDI data, and all of this is written in the gen language. So you're, it's a subset inside Max, and uh, you still are using a patching kind of, uh, a kind of, a kind of environment, but uh, you can export that code into C++, you can have certain parameters that you expose, you can then recompile that into like a VST, into an app. Um, you couldn't do it for uh, the web audio, Assembly, that is why last year uh, Rain, uh, Rainbow was released. Uh, Rainbow, like, since Rainbow took 
gen, which would let you use like 60% of the code that you wrote in Max outside of Max, it lets you, it takes you to like 95% now. It lets you do a C++ export with like full uh, documentation as to how to incorporate that into, let's say, um, another VST. So you can like build a Juice app, uh, sorry, a Juice VST straight from Rainbow. Um, you can export it to web audio, which is great. So if you have a, a patch, you like the synth sound, or you like this like generative ambience that you want to host on your website, you can just do a JavaScript egg export. If you are doing an interactive installation where, uh, let's say, you have like 16 sensors and you need to like when someone triggers sensor number one, a certain sound needs to play. You can export that to like a Raspberry Pi as well, and then. Uh, there's full set of documentation as to how you get sensors then attached to these parameters and trigger sound events. Next is pure data. Pure data, again, as I said, is like Max, just a lot less objects to use. And weirdly, when I started to work with pure data for a project, um, it, I found it that it was really, really li limiting because simple stuff like having a scale object, which you use a lot in Max, where you just want to take an incoming number that's going from, let's say, 0 to 1, and you want to scale that to 300 to 556, it's not there. You just have to like build it from scratch, which is great, because if you're used and spoiled by Max, you learn to then remake certain objects that you're really used to inside Pure Data. So you, you teach yourself how to uh, make certain things and how certain logics work. Now, Pure Data uh, doesn't natively support exporting all, uh, all, uh, all the code that you make in it, uh, but, the, but there, are, uh, there are people like uh, who develop the heavy, the heavy compiler where you can download this uh, toolchain onto your terminal and you just need to put your Pure Data patch into that and it generates um, a, a, C, a C++ code output with certain parameters that you can expose. So the only downside of that is that you need to build everything in PD vanilla. So there are a few flavors of uh, Pure Data. There's uh, Pure Data vanilla, there's Pure Data extended, which, lets you, which gives you some of the features that are then max into uh, Pure Data. And then I think so there's PD cat, which is like, it just looks a little um, better and it's a little cute. I really like using it at times when I'm when I want to feel happy. Uh, but there's pure data which you can use to export. So that's like any synthesis technique that you want to build, you can do it. So let's say you want to build a subtractive synth, you can do it in pure data, you can do it in Max, and then you can ex and, and, and then you can export it and host it in another land. Uh, granular, you can do FM. Uh, a lot of times you can do like even corn, uh, corn convolution based stuff, but that is a little bit tricky where you need to like involve other C++ code to like get it in. You can do a lot of time based pro uh, processing. So my main experience in using procedural sound design is in automotive app applications. Uh, last year I was subcontracted by a contractor for uh, an uh, an EV startup in Bangalore where they wanted to have a fake exhaust note sound for their bikes. Uh, if y'all have been around, y'all might have seen it. It's pretty, po it's pretty popular. I can't take names because I have an, an, uh, an, uh, an NDA. But how I got in touch with them is that, oh, I didn't, like, I, I, I didn't mention this. I also work for, an, for an Animal Factory and Amplifications. I am one of the three. I help in everything from circuit design to product design, graphics, marketing, PR. Um, very small car company. So yeah. Uh, so the guy who got in touch with me was one of our customers. And he was like, uh, hey, I got this project from this uh, company. We need someone who's like really good at Max. And since I had, uh, I had like tons of experience in Max and a little bit of procedural sound design X, uh, X and a little bit of procedural sound design experience, uh, I got on board with them. And since they were more of a traditional sound designer where they worked in DAW, in DA, in DA, in DAW's like Logic, they, how they were implementing their fake exhaust note was designing it in MassiveX and then exporting samples 
having samples pitched up by certain parameters, and then you interpolate between the, sam uh, between the samples uh, with like given external parameters like the throttle or the uh, RPM. And when I was got on board, like every Bangalore startup, they were in fire mode. They're like, it needs to ship next month. And I was like, y'all, uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that you cannot ship a project next month. They're like, no, we have the software. It's all taught to be a designer. We've got all these samples. And then I played it. And it first, first of all, all of your designer is... Uh, not interpreted, it's um, it's compiled. So every time you make a new design, you have to like hit compile, and you wait for five minutes, and then you, as soon as it plays, you're like, shit, that's wrong. Oh, sorry, I can't swear. Damn, it's wrong. Uh, uh, so you have to like hit stop, then go change your patch, and then see, okay, is, are, are my pitch tunings right? What's happening at like 20 kilometers per hour? Okay, it's not sounding sound right. Uh, I'm getting a lot of aliasing. So then I came in, I was like, hey guys, you know there's this thing called procedural sound design where you can like, make a synth engine, you can assign it parameters, and it's like fully real time, it takes barely any cycles on your, on your CPU, so your UI doesn't hang, because every time that they had to load in samples, uh, their UI would hang, because it's taking it from, the, uh, uh, from their storage to the RAM, and then there would be a little glitch. So it was a labor of love to get them convinced, uh, where we had to write white papers, and I'm not a developer, so I didn't know what a white paper was. So I had to write a white paper as to why we should use procedural sound design. Then there was the whole licensing talk. We got in touch with Cycling and said that, hey, you know, we want to use this. They're like, oh, yeah, there's this thing called Rain Rainbow, and we got a beta testing version of it. Turns out that if you're uh, more than $200,000 in revenue, you need to strike a licensing deal. But each time the product is shipped, uh, cycling gets a cut, so we uh, the, the higher ups went with pure data. Um, there, and that was also a whole thing of how we set up the tool chain, where we had to first make demos of certain parameters of certain synth engines because they had different synth engines that they wanted to run depending on how the UI changes. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was how how it went through. We used pure data to recreate the sounds in real time, then uh, how we would test these sounds and validate these sounds on our laptop was that we had to design an app that ran on their software that would record CAN data. If, uh, if you're not familiar with CAN, it's controller, it's controller area network. It's the protocol which, on, on which all automotive um, signals are sent through. Um, so you like what's your R RPM, what's your throttle, what's your brake time temperature, uh, is your oil low? All of that is sent through the can uh, to the can through the can net to the can net to the can network. So we had to build an app that would record can data into a CSV file. So we would record can data, go on a ride, rec and then you take all the CSV data, you convert it into a WAV file. That wave file would then be played through a through a Ableton Live, piped into pure data, which would then change parameters. So depending on how fast the person is going, how high they like, how quickly they turn their throttle, all that data would then be fed into pure data, and then pure data would make the sounds. Now, once pure data makes the sounds, you're like, okay, this is great. You which are parameters you want to expose uh, to the can and uh, to tune it afterwards, you need to like ex you need to expose that, run it through the heavy compiler. Uh, you get a C you get a C plus plus output. We would send that to the DSP team. The DSP team would then recompile it into Java, and that would run as a service. Now, after all of this is done, it's still you still need to uh, like what you make on your laptop versus how you interact with it on a vehicle is extremely different. Because you might think that okay, this sounds good when it like goes from ten, from like ten, from like ten kilometers per hour to twenty to like uh, to like uh, twenty kilometers per hour. But what happens when when you brake, like the 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 car, the sorry, the bike, the vehicle <laughs> can't say things. The vehicle is slowing down gradually, but for the user, they have like gone to a sudden stop. So how do you like bring that in? So then, okay, wait. We also need to take in brake data, and and as soon as there's a brake, um, as, as soon as we see that okay, there's a brake been uh, applied, what do you do to the pitch? What do you do the uh, uh, what do you do to the volume? 
if someone presses the front brake versus someone presses the back brake, because the back brake is a more slow down, gentle stop, but like the front brake is a like immediate stop. So how do we bring that in? So all of this, if you had to do this via samples, I mean, you can't do it. Like there's no way. So that is what uh, that is what we had done for that team. Uh, it went well. They shipped it. I don't know how many people use the uh, use the feature that we worked on, but it's there. Um, and so that is what you can do for uh, vehicles. And that is more as a, a thing called AVAS, uh, acoustic vehicle alerting system. Uh, 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 alerting system for e for for, e for for EVs where they are so quiet between the zero to twenty kilometers per hour that it's a kind of a hazard for people with uh, limited vision. Oh, uh, so yeah. So what you can do is that uh, there are other car companies in like Porsche and BMW that are like having this plate inside their cars because they want their users to feel because they have this pedigree of having all these V8 engines and V and V12 engines and they want to recreate that experience in their cars so they have that inside uh, inside their cars to have their users feel like oh yeah this sounds great there's Mercedes who makes like really really nice sound for their EQS engine it sounds somewhere between Tron and yeah, it's great. And then they also like brought in regen. So each time the car goes into regen mode, there's a different sound that plays. So it also aff uh, like affirms to the user that, okay, you know what, all of these things are actually happening in the car and it's a more rounded experience. Uh, this is a project that I worked on uh, while I was working at a architectural studio in Boston, uh, doing a lot of installations. My boss was kind of a crazy guy. He was from the Media Lab in his 60s. He found a Porsche Targa that was uh, on the verge of breaking down, so he converted into uh, an electronic vehicle. This was the first time back in 2019 when I first got ex exposed to procedural sound design. And over here, there's uh, the whole UI of the car was built in Max, which I don't know why he did that, but everything that we did was done in Max. So we had like 30 installations that ran 24-7 throughout Europe and the US. And for some reason, he always stuck to Max. And... Um, it's not the best thing. Like, it's great to pro pro prototype in Max. You don't really ship pro a, pro a product in Max, but working over there, I learned how you can actually ship a, a, a product in Max. And this is one of the engines that didn't get uh, um, assigned. Like, it didn't go through, like, the high ups didn't like it. But I loved it, so this is a quick... This is made with just FM, uh, but instead of using like it's a two two operator two channel FM, but instead of using sine waves, you just like use a triangle or a saw and a phaser. You put some offsets, and weirdly, it sounds like a very good engine. Uh, video games, I think so. I quickly spoke on this. Um, you use it that you can use it for footsteps. You can use it for. Uh, waterfall sounds, like all your environmental sounds. Procedural sound design is great for that because you don't need to like ship like a 20 second waterfall sound that has to continuously loop. You just have a few cycles and you can just have it, run, uh, have it uh, run, uh, running in the back. You have adaptive scores. This is something that Mick Gordon used for Doom. If you haven't checked that GTDC talk, it's a great one as to how when a guy comes in front, how's the music changed. He has not used, pro he has not used procedural sound design, but uh, it's also a great way to like use those techniques into processual sound design. This is a quick thing that I had made in RNBO to create a environmental sound for Unity. So I just built a plugin that gives me like a nighttime ambience, uh, and you have full control. Like here, I've only uh, exposed the parameters for the volumes, but you can expose any parameter that you build into the synth as well. Uh, challenges, balancing computer power versus audio quality, procedural sound design doesn't always sound great. Like in, without, con uh, without uh, context, some of the footsteps sound terrible. But then it's only when you put that footstep into the video and you see the person's step is where, you, where you make, your brain makes a connection. You're like, oh wait, yeah, no, that is a footstep. So always, you're, always you need to balance that as to how much audio, how much stuff do you, like how much, reliance you give to audio quality versus computing power. You can make engaging sound soundscapes. 
compatibility, you can have this hosted on the web, or you can have it on an STM Thalassu board, you can have it on FPGA if you want, you can have it as an Android app, anywhere. Uh, as long as it's in C, C++, it can be compiled and output wherever you want. And there are some regulatory aspects. This is mainly for uh, electronic vehicles as to how loud they are, how quiet they are. All of this, because it's such a tunable system based on wherever you ship this item. Like um, uh, Europe has a very different legal system as to how loud the car needs to be versus the US. And there are also different things like you can have a fart sound for your backing up thing because which Tesla, which Tesla, which Tesla does, that doesn't fly in Europe. So you can always, you know, balance all these things out. Future trends, AI-driven or, or AI-driven AI audio integration. There's a company in Germany that's doing this where they have procedural sound design models that uh, are tuned to how the person is driving. So it like takes in all the data of how hard they accelerate, how slow they accelerate. And they take all that data and they change their models in real time with that. There's real time environmental sim 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 simulation. It's great for VR and all that stuff. I'm not really into that as of right now, but I'm sure it's going to be um, our future. And the best practice is always test in context. Never have it on your headphones and test it on your laptop and be like, this sounds great. You need to sh put it on the vehicle, you need to put it in the game, you need to put it wherever it needs to be and always test in context because your models really change depending on wherever they are shipped. So always test in context, that's my best practice thing. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, this is more of a hardware question. Um, where are the speakers uh, placed in the vehicle? Uh, is it where the engine typically was at? Because that's where the sound comes from. But it's more of a curiosity. Like where in in the in the vehicle that I worked on? Let's oh. say you're working on a motorcycle. Let's assume you're working on a motorcycle. Um, in that case. It depends. So ideally, um, you would want them to be at your level, but it, uh, you always want to design from how a traditional motorcycle works if, is, if that's what you want to recreate. Correct. So you'd want it in the body. You'd want it because you'd want it where a traditional engine would be. Correct. Uh, then that's, again, the bulk of the sound comes from the silencer, not yeah. necessarily the engine. Yeah. And so that's you, kind of in the behind. So. Yeah, so you would want it. There's Revolt, who's done a great job. Uh, they are more of like a performance sco scooter and where they are uh, speakers places that it's placed right underneath the battery where, uh, so if you have a traditional fuel tank, it's placed underneath that uh -huh. and it's a huge subwoofer that also like shakes the bike a little bit. Okay. So that is where they have placed it and honestly that was the best implementation that I've seen in India for uh, an EVAS system. So it, that, that also gives you like a sense of like a vibration, like the engine It does, is yeah. And it like reaffirms that you are riding. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people don't use it, uh, but for the ones who are like ice nerds, they really like that. So for them, they like keep it there. Also the size of your speaker change, like depends on how good it'll sound. So you can create the best sound that like, you know, sounds great, but then if you are, uh, developing a sound that's going to be on like a one-in speaker, you need to take those challenges and considerations into account when you're delivering uh, a product like this. And are the speakers mature enough to be like, or are they cased well enough to be like roadproof? You know, like um, water, dust, I mean, I am damage. Uh, I'm. I don't really deal in that. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I hope they are. I mean, because I'm they should be. They should be. But yeah. From your testing perspective. Oh, from, from my testing, I can't comment on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I would like to, but uh, I might get into legal troubles. I can't do that. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I just wanted to ask in terms of the safety considerations. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm guessing in this case you were talking about the safety of the rider and being able to know when they're braking and feel intuitively feel that. Uh, no, that is the safety of everyone around, around the rider as well. Yeah, yes. which is what I wanted to ask. Um, especially, I guess in the Indian context where a lot of places we don't have footpaths, mm-hmm. we have pedestrians on the street. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of times I felt the wind of the electric bus. Passed mm. by me before I knew there was a bus. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what kind of um, things uh, did you take into? I mean, what kind of uh, factors did you take, take into consideration? Into consideration and what um, do you know about them? So, there is no regulatory body set up in India that is checking this. Yeah. That's why most of our electric vehicles, like and the companies in India, they don't really have it. Either um, their engine is loud enough, so you know that it's there. Uh, but there are a lot of buses that don't know. And uh, so we usually try and st- stick with the European uh, standard where between 0 and 20 kilometers per hour, which is the speed at which it is quiet enough and there's not enough wind noise to like know that there is something near you. Uh, it needs to, I think so, hit like 80, not, not 85, that's way low. I think so 75 or, or, or something in like a certain radius. radius. Yeah, that was like we were following that because... India doesn't have any and, regular uh, body Did you also that. take into consideration maybe a higher noise floor in India? Um, yes, we did take that into consideration. But by the end of the project, it turned more into shipping the product than keeping these things into mind. So I'm, I'm guessing if there's someone who's taking a more uh, slow approach to like building um, this feature into it, they will keep all of these things into con- into uh, consideration. The Porsche Targa that I worked on, um, my boss wanted that to be road road legal in Lexington County, and for that we had certain things that we need to meet. So there we like paid attention to it. That is only because he wanted to like drive it in his city. Yeah, but so we had like a Bose sound, a Bose sound system, and the huge sub subwoofer that would just make. Uh, um, we I tried to I tried to um, I tried to emulate a Porsche sound. Uh, it wasn't great because that was my first time doing it. Uh, but yeah, it worked, and he just needed to like drive in his city, so that's why we had it. 